Now, our final presenter uh, in this session is Dr. Werner Fasslebend. And as you can read in your program, uh, he is president of the Austrian Institute for European and Security Policy and served as Austria's Federal Minister of Defense from 1990 to 2000, during which time he initiated far-reaching reforms in the Ministry of Defense in Austria and adapted the organization of the armed forces to the new threat scenario. He also served as president of the Austrian parliament from 2000 to 2002. Uh, however, the reason I really called him my favorite diplomat is because uh, when I did journey to Austria uh, in 2018 uh, with my wife to, uh, to attend actually Dr. Hak Jahan Moon's rally and to make a pilgrimage to that, hey, that, that, that source of sacred music, which is in fact Vienna, <laughs> uh, Dr. Faslebend uh, uh, made comments. I think he introduced Mrs. Moon actually. And uh, I felt that it was so insightful that he had, really, uh, he had really understood what she was trying to do and what these organizations are trying to do. And I also felt that his remarks uh, gave a message to her that people were getting it. People like Dr. Fasla Ben were receptive to her ideas and could work with her. So I feel like he's been such an important part of the development of these organizations. So I'm really uh, very honored to have him be a part of our panel. Dr. Fasla Ben. Yeah, thank you very much for praising me so much. So I guess it's not necessary anymore to make a long presentation. Uh, before I want to start with my speech, I just uh, will try to make a short remark about my background. I was born and brought up in a small town in Lower Austria, immediately at the border towards Slovakia. From my house to the Iron Curtain, there was only a distance of around about 100, 150 meters. And so far from my very early childhood, uh, I was confronted with the situation at the other side. There was almost no week when during some night you could hear uh, the yelling of people, shouting, crying, uh, barking, barking dogs, and shooting. And you can imagine that for uh, a young boy, this certainly is an experience he never will forget. And therefore, also this question to overcome uh, this system at the other side occupied myself from my very early childhood. So uh, what I will try today is, due to the situation you are confronted uh, in Korea, maybe uh, to talk about the lessons, the lessons learned, uh, how we could overcome the situation in Europe, how German re reunification started again, how it was possible. And I tried uh, to do it I will try to do it with uh, eight priority points. And the first one is, if you want to overcome such a complex political situation, strategic situation, uh, where the whole world more or less is inflicted, you need a solid political basis. And if you ask me what is this political basis, I would say it's the people the people themselves. I mean, just look at our experience. At the end of the 40s, uh, the two major pact systems were established. NATO on the one hand and the Warsaw Pact system, system uh, at the other side. But already in 1953, there was the first rebellion in Berlin when people just went on the street and tried to fight against Soviet tanks with their empty hands. 1953. Of course, this was defeated pretty soon. There was no chance for them to win. But only three years later, you had a very similar situation in Hungary, in Budapest, where once again people 
went on the streets, demonstrated, and fought with their empty hands against Soviet tanks. And of course, again, they didn't have any chance to win. They were defeated. And it lasted a little bit longer. But 12 years thereafter, you had the spring in Prague. You had a similar development in Czechoslovakia. And again, people went without armament, uh, walked on the streets, and fought against the Soviet tanks. And the whole Warsaw Pact system concentrated its troops over there. And of course, they overcame it. And for a few years, there was nothing. But around about 12 years later, once again, this time in Poland, in the shipyards of Dansk, a simple worker, a unionist, stood up against the system. And nobody could defeat him anymore. Because the Soviet system or the communist system could not shoot into the docks and the shipyards in Dansk. They could not shoot their own workers, uh, that the unions that uh, belonged to the Communist Party because they would have lost every credibility. And then so far, to look at this uh, question, people's dreams, people's visions, people's ambitions, and people's will probably is in the long run the most decisive factor to overcome such a system as the communist system. OK. What can you do from the political side? From the political side, it is necessary not just to follow a pure uh, principle and try to keep your position. If you want to overcome it, of course, you have to go new ways. And this would mean pragmatism. And if I think back, you know, when just a few years, I think it was only two years uh, after the Soviet tanks had demolished uh, the spring in Prague. The German Chancellor Willy Brandt shaped his new Ostpolitik, his Eastern policy, as he called it, which meant that just in a very pragmatic way, he tried to, to start a dialogue with the other side, with people he did not like. He disliked the system and the people, but still he did it in order to overcome, in order to get in contact. And I think this is extremely uh, important. And if you think uh, to a later period, you know, at the end of the Cold War, when Helmut Kohl really tried to become a friend of Mr. Gorbachev on the other side, that he invested not only in, I don't know, coming together, but even tried you know, to shape familiar situations. He did not come with a suit and a tie, but uh, he met Gorbachev uh, with his vest, you know, and just a simple shirt, you know, uh, in order to shape this familiar situation. Then you can see that uh, this personal relationship, of course, in politics was very important and will be very important also in the future. But you certainly also need a program. A positive program, a program that is speaking about peace and prosperity, about freedom. And that, this is something that happened at the same time. Also, just a few years after the spring, uh, political spring in, Czechos in Czechoslovakia, both sides, East and West, decided uh, to go a new way. And they started negotiations. They started the process that was called the CSCE. A conference on security, a conference on cooperation. And they shaped three baskets. And those baskets, the contents of uh, the program was security, economic cooperation, and human contacts. And at the end, probably all of them were extremely important for the success of this process and this procedure. And therefore, also, my fourth point is not only shape, or the fifth point already, not only shape a program, 
and shape a new procedure, but make it permanent. And it's quite interesting that this CSCA process lasted until the end of the Cold War, and not only until the end of the Cold War, it then became from CAC, the, even an international organization, as OSCE, Organization uh, for, Cooperation, for Security and Cooperation in Europe, and it's still existing. Why? Because you never can predict in politics, you know, when the right moment will come. And if you have a steady, a permanent program, uh, where you also can overcome difficulties in the meantime, uh, wait for the next best opportunity and chance, this certainly is a good way. The sixth point I would say is never act only out of a position of weakness, but try to act out of a position of power, not overwhelming power. Maybe equal power is enough, but do it in order not to be just uh, an offer for the other side, but also to, to be able to keep your own position. And I think this, this take and give is a precondition for being successful. And if you look back what, what happened, you know, uh, in this time, it's quite interesting. This is the period where we had uh, the so-called NATO double decision. On the one hand, enforcing new armament, and on the other hand, also offering a dialogue to the East. Out of a position of strength, going into a dialogue. And it was successful at the end. Yeah. Uh, in addition, I would say it's all it's also quite interesting uh, well, to, to serve yourself not only on political contexts, but also on private personalities, on the civil society. If you think what important role, not only the big statesmen like Kohl and Genscher and Gorbachev and, and Willy Brandt, as I said, and the American presidents, uh, Reagan and others had uh, in this context, but which important role the Pope played, the Polish Pope at this time, which important role uh, just a man of literature like Václav Havel, the later president of, Czechos of Czech Republic played, and others can tell you how important it is, not only to make politics but try to involve the best parts of the society. Yeah, and the last point I would say is prepare. Prepare yourself for the unexpected because you never know when it will happen. Prepare yourself for reunification and keep patience. Keep patience before and afterwards, even after reunification, you will need patience, as we can see in the relationship in Germany between East and West. But you always have to think, and when I say prepare it in the best way, what do I mean? Just think what will happen if Korea will be unified. This will change the strategic situation in Eastern Asia completely. A powerhouse, a new powerhouse will be there with the economic strength of the South and the weaponized system of the North. Just a big nation compared uh, to Japan and to others. And of course, this will be a factor that not only uh, is easy to handle for the others, but also will bring some concern. I mean, if we look back, we have to be aware uh, before German unification, you know, the two nations that were against it were the two friendly nations, the French and the British. They were against it. And only a person, and because uh, Cole was capable, able to react and act very quickly, he could overcome this situation. 
but prepare yourself also psychologically. What will be necessary in order uh, to skip out these concerns, what will happen afterwards after reunification? And insofar, it's a big, a big challenge, of course. But going back to the beginning, I would say the most important thing certainly is not to give up, never give up. And even if you get into a situation that is extremely difficult, and even if you are in a situation that nobody th is thinking that it could be possible, do not forget it. Believe in it. And when the people believe in it, uh, and also the political system is believing it, you can be sure you will reach the game and the goal. Why? Because this certainly is the dream of the Korean people. It is their vision. It is uh, their ambition. And therefore, sooner or later, it will come. It, it will not only bring solution for Korean problems. It will bring many small problems uh, for the nation. But of course, it is extremely important for security and stability in Eastern Asia and for peace and security all over the world. Thank you for your attention.